because that ended up with Lance. So yeah, there, there, there is a loophole. <laughs> but you can't even change the date. I can't even look at my YouTube account. So I just said, I'm probably getting stuff I know locally or something like this. I can grab my phone over from the command line, basically. There's no Okay, it's okay, Jeff. They're not books. Anyway, if you want to install a program, you can run the file or something. We just drag, yeah. drag it to the desktop. Yeah. 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 But if you want to ask, yeah, install something. Oh, yeah, you can. Just like, sure. Okay. Well, you're a Linux guy. As I said, it was a solution. So return that, bring yeah. something yeah. else, or your yeah. server yeah. chain. Yeah. Hopefully, my laptop is going to be fixed. Yeah. Yeah. What happened to the common fire? How did it get an edge of fire? Come on. From the it literally did. It, like, it went black, and I guess the blackness of the screen, I could see like a stream of smoke. Oh, wow. Are you serious? Yeah, that's what it. Okay, let's get started. I think you should vacuum your laptop occasionally. That's a problem. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to allow that. I can always go like that. Okay, so this <laughs> could come up any time. We're going to continue today talking about the spectral, the spectral analysis and the ways how to separate our image into into multiple wavelengths and obtain the third dimension in our data cube. So during the previous class, we discussed the theoretical concepts of our hyperbolism, and we have sliced the data cube. And when I say the data cube, I mean x, y, lambda. We have sliced it parallel to x and y. And somehow that's more intuitive way to uh, to do spectral analysis, right? Because if I asked you separate, to separate the uh, uh, image into into colors, you would say, okay, well let's put a filter that only transmits this color and then this color and then this color and so on. Somehow to our to, to a complete novice in astrophysics, that is more natural thing to, to do, I presume. But actually, historically, that's not what people did. People uh, performed spectroscopy or spectrometry or spectogra spectrography, spectrography in a different way. So here is one of the first spectra ever to be recorded. I'm not 100% sure whether coloring is original or it was colored later, but this is the spectrum drawn. It was drawn. It was. It was. This it was color by me. Oh, okay. Because I also saw black and white version. So this is the spectra observed and recorded by uh, Josef von Fraunhofer, who's uh, yeah, well, also the guy who theoretically explained the far field regime of the diffraction. He was obviously a genius. And uh, all these dark absorption lines that we see in the solar spectra today are called, are named after him from over lines. So you can always, I mean, it's always interesting to test uh, yourself because I'm not solar physicist by, I'm, I'm like a doctor solar physicist, so I don't know, nobody taught me these things, but like, do you know some, um, some interesting from over lines, by, for example? Okay, what is, this is the right. The, this is how he, he denoted them, right? So D are the two lines of sodium, right? Mm -hmm. Then H H alpha is what C C, C right? And A and B are A is an oxygen band of our atmosphere. B I don't remember. It's also atmospheric. It's also atmospheric, but I don't remember what it is. Okay. Yeah, and then, I mean, the later they, when they look more carefully, they saw there's D1, D2, D3, sure. but then they all, huh? So you see why D1 is at a longer wavelength. D2. D1 is coming from the left side. D1 yeah, 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 yeah. is 5896, D2 is 5890, D3 is 5876. Yes, yes, yes. So, the opposite so, of the, the opposite of how we would have written them now. Does anybody know how, so if you look up here, uh, Actually, he drew something amazing. He drew this curve, which looks very much like like Planck distribution. Do you know how he basically measured the intensity of the light? It's like a depth, like a thermometer. thermometer. They use the thermometer and then they put it in front of the. Uh, so after they disperse the light, they put the thermometer in. And I don't know if it was Fraunhofer or somebody else, but actually. Uh, I'm not 100% sure about this ultra wavelength of UV wavelengths here. They're sort of sketched to me. But they, that way, they discovered infrared radiation. That they just moved the thermometer to empty place, but it still got warmer because there was, there was infrared radiation coming from the sun. So, Herschel. 
the, like uh, yeah. the, the yeah. ten years before him. Very good. That was her show. Very good. Yeah. <laughs> but was it really before? That was before him? Second show. Okay. Well, people were. Yeah, I mean, back then the, the news didn't spread so fast, so people were inventing things in a similar way, right? And actually, some people who contributed a lot to, to the development of the spectrographs were Kirchhoff and Bunsen, and this uh, design of the first scientifically usable spectrograph, so to speak, to do comparisons between the laboratory valence and the observed valence was made by, uh, by Robert Bunsen. And uh, these people were also geniuses. I mean, you know Kirchhoff through many other laws, like uh, the also diffraction laws, like Kir kirchhoff Reynolds diffraction formula, and then Kirchhoff's law for the currents, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And this here is a very interesting instrument. So obviously, they used the uh, they used the prism uh, uh, originally, and the idea was the following: that you have basically a light coming from the from from the sun to some system of lenses, and then also come light coming from benzen, uh, benzen burner, so that you could compare the wavelengths of the Fraunhofer lines basically with the wavelengths that are produced by the burning gas in the lab. And that way, basically, Kirchhoff and Bosen uh, gave birth to astrophysics because they sort of showed that we can analyze the spectra of celestial bodies and compare them with the spectra of gases in our lab, and that way probe the composition. Of the, of the atmospheres of other stars, right? And they first identified, I don't know how many different elements, but you all probably know the story that helium we first discovered in the sun, and then later we discovered it uh, on the earth, et cetera, et cetera. So this was like 150 uh, years ago. And there is no surprise that for the, for the original cover of the, of the presentation, I used this uh, album cover of maybe the best album of maybe the best. <laughs> Best band ever to ever to exist is that also something that they teach us first when we when we learn about something called dispersion uh, or simply dividing the light in in uh, wavelengths that constitute it and uh, the responsible phenomena for this in the case of prism is the fact that different wavelengths have slightly different indices of refraction so if you put multiple wavelengths on one side then they will exit the prism under under different angles, and then you can basically use the use the prism to separate the light, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But we're not going to talk about it today. Today we're going to talk about uh, the optical elements that we actually use in our today's telescope, and these don't work on, on this principle. Although I'm sure that there is somewhere a historical telescope that still uses prism, and actually we use them in like these combinations, prisms, right? Do we have that in some of the solar telescopes? No, not really. No. Yeah. No. 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 That's right. Okay, so let's move on and let's talk about, about the diffraction. So we already spoke about the diffraction in the context of the diffraction on our primary, and we saw the way how to derive this, and I'm just gonna repeat, we don't have to go through the derivation, of course. I'm just gonna repeat how the diffraction looks like for a single slit. Right, and this is always good to have it somewhere in the back of your head because also this way you can convince yourself that 1.22 lambda over d makes sense. Because if you derive it for just one d case of one slit, you're going to get lambda over d, which is almost the same, and it's much much easier than to solve for the for the spectral uh, uh, for the spectral. Uh, for, the spectral, for the spherical aperture. Sorry, I was trying to remember what slide comes next. So uh, we can, let's analyze what happens here uh, a little bit, a little bit further, because it will also be useful when we want to derive a more complicated case. So we have shown that uh, the intensity the distribution here in the far field in brown copper regime looks like this, looks like basically sinc squared, which is sine squared alpha over alpha squared, and in, the, in this case alpha is pi theta a over lambda, where a is the, uh, where A is the width of this slit here. So I just want to use this simplest possible case to emphasize two things. One is that for, uh, that for the first maxima, we're gonna have theta equals zero, and basically all the wavelengths are gonna be coinciding. But for the other maxima here, 
have maxima basically the uh, what you you need to take derivative of this expression here, and it's actually not so trivial. Maybe some of you remember that you were drawing these curves and then you were intersecting it or something. Basically, to find the maxima of this equation here, you need to, in a way, numerically uh, find 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 the solution. If you don't trust me, we can we can do it later. But that's not the point. The point is that if you want to for the first maxima. You're going to get the first maxima for alpha equals zero, right? But for every other maxima, you're going to get different values of, uh, of alpha, which actually correspond to, I mean, you're, you're going to get the fixed values of alpha, uh, but since valence are different, then the corresponding theta values are going to be different, which means that different valence are going to, the maxima at different valence are going to be at the different locations. So in principle, we already see that even the simplest diffraction on one slit is going to separate the valence. Now, of course, we cannot, we cannot use this. Why? Well, because there is very, very little light here. And also, in order to get the, the good separation, you would have to have very, very unrealistic size of this and so on. But then we can make a more complicated, we can make a more complicated diffraction experiment. And already when you put two slits, you see that your original diffraction pattern, which was sync, is now modulated by much faster cosine, uh, cosine squared term, which comes from the interference of these two slits here. And now, as I'm increasing the number of slits, what's happening? I have these maxima that are more separated, these primary maxima, that are more separated and that are, more, that are better defined, that are thinner. Right. So now we're going to spend some time talking what happens here and deriving some equations and seeing how the things work out here. So just one thing about the notation. We're only going to be focusing ourselves at this primary diffraction maximum here. So usually, generally, I don't like to make distinction between the diffraction and interference because it's all the same phenomena. It's just the superposition of waves. But here when I say diffraction, I'm going to say, okay, it's, it's the term coming from the diffraction one slit. It's this huge envelope. But the, the, when I say interference, I mean this faster modulation induced by the, by the interference between the individual, between the separate slits, right? And then when I say primary maxima, I literally mean these more pronounced maxima here, because you see now that we also have the, the secondary maxima in between them. All right. So, Let's see how we can describe it with the equation. Well, we talked about when we spoke about the, the, the spatial resolution, which was maybe two weeks ago. We talked about that the most beautiful thing about the diffraction is that it's actually Fourier transformation of the aperture. And the Fourier transformation is a very nice thing because we can, uh, if we can write our aperture as convolution of multiple terms, we can then write the, the interference pattern or diffraction pattern as the product of the individual dimensions. So if I have multiple slits, each of them with finite width, I can write it as the convolution between these two things. Basically, multiple delta functions separated by term D, convolved with one slit of width A. Okay? And yeah, and then the corresponding intensities for the, for the series delta, delta function looks something like this. So sine squared and delta over sine squared delta, where delta depends on the separation between the slits and on the wavelength. While for the individual slits, we have sinc squared. So my final interference pattern is going to be product between these two things. And if I was going to plot this now for one wavelength, for choosing uh, width of the slit, for choosing separation between the slits and for num for five slits, we would get interference with the pattern something like this. And here I'm restricting myself to a relatively narrow, but still actually very wide range of angles going from minus one to one degree. Okay. This is how the interference would look like. And actually a lot of details you're not seeing because the thickness of the line in the plot is obscuring what is happening down here. Is that degree or gradient? I mean, it, this will change, of course, in the size of 
no, no, it's 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 degree. It would water it would be would be too much. Yeah. So now what I'm going to do is I'm only going to zoom into one tenth of this region, and actually now we see a little bit better what is happening. So this is now the the zoom on the innermost uh, diffraction envelope, and we now see very nicely that there are two kinds of, of maxima here. And then we see that if I increase, for example, the total number of, of slits, so everything stays the same, the separation between states stays the same, the, uh, the width of each individual slit stays the same. What I get is that I get more, smaller secondary maxima, and I get, uh, technically speaking, uh, higher, right? Uh, maxima, which are also much, much better defined. Okay, much more. Cool. Well, but we still didn't mention what happens when we do, when we use different wavelengths. However, here is an example. So now I'm doing the same. I have 10, 10 slits again, and I'm plotting the situation for wavelength, for two different wavelengths. And now you see basically what are we trying to achieve here. We are basically separating the wavelengths. Uh, by letting things go through the diffraction grating, because we see that the maxima of the light are going to be placed at, at different angular positions. So let's discuss a little bit what we what we see here. So what is the difference between the blue and the red maxima here? What is something that that you can obviously see? There are different angles. Like which one is more different? Right, and, and it sort of makes sense, and it sort of fits, fits with, with this equation here, because when you solve this equation here, you're going to get some values for delta, and then bigger values of lambda have bigger angle theta corresponding to that. Right. So that sort of makes sense here. Also, for basically the same reason, uh, red maxima are uh, broader. Right, and you can actually see it here. And these are some things that we were expecting. But one interesting thing for me that also illustrates some of the problems when we practically use the spectrographs is that after a while, your maxima are going to start overlapping. You can't really see it here, but for example, uh, let's say that this is maxima number zero. So uh, blue maxima number three occurs before the red maxima number two. Right? And if I played a little bit with wavelengths, I could have actually made them overlap. So the situation is not so ideal, of course. If you just let things go through the diffraction grating and you want to look at huge range of wavelengths, you need a bit more complicated thing than a, than a simple diffraction grating. Okay, yeah, so these are the, these are the things that I, that I wanted us to, to notice here. Okay, so let's try now I mean, now what, what I'm going to do is something very obvious that you're probably already su suspecting. Now, I want to somehow figure some properties of the shape of this maxima, and you are already guessing that more narrow these maxima are, better our spectral re resolution is. It's pretty similar to the case of fabric where we wanted to get very narrow transmission in order to separate wavelengths better. So let's try all together, and using this equation here, try to figure out where this principal maxima, right? So when I say, and, and to make things simpler, you can completely ignore this thing squared alpha here, because we said we are only restricting ourselves to the innermost diffraction envelope, right? So we only want to see where this term here, sine square and delta, over sine square delta, is, has, the, has the maximum value. I mean, obvious solution is for delta equals zero, right? So you can think a little bit about it. It's not so. You can also guess it. You don't have to analyze it from this. You can just sketch what happens. You have. Basically, we are only focusing here on the interference between the, between the different slits. We don't care about the diffraction on an individual slit. 
actually maybe to derive it wouldn't be so easy. So try to guess. So okay, let's let, let's take a look at the solution. Actually, it's gonna it's gonna happen when both sine and delta and sine delta are zero, right? Then we can expand these things and play a little bit with uh, L'Hopital's rule, and we can get that uh, we'll actually see that this is more or less proportional to n squared in this case. And uh, the angular locations of these of these maxima are gonna correspond to m times lambda divided by d, where m is an integer. And these different numbers that I call the maximum number 0, 1, 2 is what we call the order. And you will hear very often, and we'll talk about it a little bit later, when people say we are observing at this and this order, it means we are looking at such and such maxima and the, and the light separated at, at, that, at that order. And we're, we're not going to see that basically we want to look at high orders because light is better better separated there. And from there you can also derive something called dispersion, which is basically the derivative of the diffracted angle with respect to the wavelength, and you see that it's proportional to the, to the order. Okay, in a similar way, you can derive the positions of the minima. And this is a little bit easier, because now for the minima, you, we are ignoring sink, the sink squared term here. We are just assuming that uh, sine square n delta is zero, but sine square delta is not zero, right? And for that, what you have to get, well, basically you have to, you, you, you have to satisfy this condition that n, which is the number of, uh, which is the number of slits, times pi times d theta over lambda, which is basically n delta, is equal now some other integer number, m prime times pi, right? And basically, you can think about m prime in the in the following way: it's after I have fixed my m, after I'm at some uh, primary maxima, that m prime counts the number of minima until my next maxima, and then I reset and I start again, and so on and so on. And this is pretty useful because this now allows us to basically describe the width of the maxima. Because it's strictly speaking going to be just the separation between uh, half, in this case, I, I defined it as a half of the separation between two local minima. So let's go back to this. So, so you can see here, this is the primary maxima, right? We see the secondary maxima next to it. The width, of, or the half width in this case of my, of my maximum here, is going to be the half of the distance between the two between the two zeros, or if you want the, the distance between the maximum and, and one zero. And it should be relatively obvious that it's going to be, uh, that this width is going to be uh, lambda over md. Right. And now I can, I can basically derive this width in terms of the, of the wavelength, and we are going to use the same trick that we used before for fabric perot What I'm going to do, well, I had the width in terms of the angle. I'm going to say that my delta lambda is what? Is d theta over d lambda. Sorry, it should be uh, it should be reversed. It should be reversed here. Yeah. It should be d lambda over d theta times delta theta, but I carried out the uh, uh, the rest of the of the derivation properly. Don't worry. So we are going to see that the, uh, this width in terms of in terms of wavelength is inversely proportional 
to m, the order of the maxima, and to the total number of uh, and to the total number of uh, slits here. Okay. So then, if we define the resolution in the same way as we did previously, as the ratio between the wavelength we're looking at and the width of the maxima, you're going to get that it's proportional to the order and proportional to the uh, uh, to the number of uh, to the number of slits. So practically speaking, that means that we want to make the diffraction gratings, which have a lot of slits, right? And actually. It looks a little bit counterintuitive, but the only thing that matters is the total number of sets. So in principle, you have a huge grating with, with small number of sets. It's not a practical thing to make because you need to fill it all with the light and so on and so on, but you could do that. And then you also want to look in as big order as possible to get as good spectral resolution as you can. Of course, there is a problem there because we have seen before that higher orders are sort of decaying. They have less and less light, and so on and so on. So by combining these two numbers, you can get various sort of spectral resolutions. And for example, for the nighttime observations, you have everything ranging from a few thousand to a few hundred thousand, right? When we look at the sun, we mostly, at least in telescopes that we are dealing with, we have ratings that achieve at least a hundred thousand resolution. Okay. I don't know what's, for example, uh, this no. This this should be two hundred thousand. Yeah. And no, that's that's the number. I mean, about a hundred to hundred thousand. Yeah. So there Some used to be many 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 years ago, they would go for very high spectral resolution. You know, five hundred thousand or or more if possible. Um, but that has been abandoned because then you have other issues, right? You have no light and, and so on. Yeah. But it was also mostly for atlases and things like that, where you look at the whole sun and then you have a lot of light yes. and so on. Yeah. Uh, since at the time maybe the spatial resolution was not so uh, great, uh, you would deduce you know the spatial inhomogeneity is from the behavior of the, of the spectral lines, the asymmetries, and and the like. Okay, so anyway, we have seen now that basically by using the refraction grating and just letting the light of many wavelengths go through, we're going to get some sort of separation. And the accuracy, if you want, of that separation, or in a way the spectral resolution, which is basically equivalent to what we called before spatial resolution, looks something like this. And in principle, what you want to take care, I mean, the same way that when we talked about the spatial resolution, we wanted our spatial resolution, we wanted the minimum angle that we can resolve to be smaller than the size of the spatial features in the sun. Now we want exactly the same. If we are for some reason expecting spectrum to variate on some very fine uh, scale of wavelengths, we want our spectral resolution delta lambda to be smaller than that in order to resolve these uh, to resolve these scales. And I have shown you before, and we will also look at some examples today that the spectral lines have a lot of features in them, and that we want to be able to resolve these features. Okay, cool. Uh, well, it turns out we won't be. I actually was just complaining that I don't uh, that, that it's hard to explain and uh, and a bit uh, cumbersome to derive, but you can derive it and we can take a look at it together if you want. But it turns out that first of all, you don't have to have a transmission grating. They don't have to be slits on a, on an obstacle. Those can be just the mirrors aligned like this, and also these mirrors can be blazed or inclined. And it turns out that that way you can focus most of the intensity in one specific order, if you want. And these are some of the things that help your grading be more efficient. And I already want to emphasize something, and that's by looking at this image, you see already that not all red light, let's say that this red light corresponds to exactly 650 nanometers, whatever exactly means, it's not all focused in the same place. Is divided between the multiple maxima, right? So we are, if we just use the grating this way, we would lose a lot of light because, strictly speaking, we would measure only one, we would measure only one order. In case of Fabry Perot, that was not the case. We would tune our Fabry Perot so that it transmits that wavelength and all the light would go through. So this process of, of, of blazing, which I will leave for those who are truly interested in the production of the diffraction gratings, 
helps you this way because it helps you focus most of the intensity in the uh, in the order that you want to take that you want to to look at. Okay, so how does it work in the in the context of the telescope? And this is maybe the simplest possible. This is maybe the simplest possible case that that we would have into our telescope. So the light comes here through the primary mirror and is focused here in the focal plane, and we get the image here. And then from that image, we slice a small piece. So for the moment, just assume that we are gonna slice one point. So somehow, magically, we just take one point from the image. We're gonna see very soon that we are not taking one point. We can take a stripe. But let's say that then this one point goes through the another lens, which we call collimator, which makes these rays parallel again. And then they bounce off the grating. And that's where the light is now dispersed. And then you have another lens, which people call camera, which can be a little bit uh, uh, confusing, but that's basically camera would be detector and the, it's camera lens together. And then it focuses our light on the detector. And there we see basically the spectrum of this little point that we have cut out here. Okay. So if we talked about it, looking at the real data, okay, actually that now helps us a little bit better understand what this image here means, right? So I have shown you this in the, in the first lecture. So this is the original image that they were looking at. From that image, they sliced this piece here, right? And then that piece, that sort of stripe of light goes into your spectrograph, gets dispersed perpendicularly to this slice here, and we're gonna call, call this slice slit now because we don't have to talk about the diffraction grating slits. This is slit, or as we call it, spectrograph slit. And then the light is dispersed that way, and actually, here you see that this dark stripe parallel to the slit has nothing to do with the slit. This dark stripe is the absorption line. Okay. And you can preserve your spatial information along one axis, right, which in this case would be Y. So the spectral resolution, the spatial resolution here is very bad. So you can't see granules, for example, but you see that the darker regions here correspond to the sunspot, okay? While this is now the valent information, and the important thing here, of course, is that the, the, the absorption line is split over the, over the sunspot, and that was sort of a proof that the sunspots are, are, sunspots are harboring magnetic fields. So if we were to look, uh, so so how does it work? Basically, now instead of uh, uh, instead of looking at one wavelength at a time, we are looking at one x or y position at a time. So we take a, slit, a slice of the image along this slit, and we disperse it perpendicularly to slit. And then, of course, we have to record it on our two D detector. That was the primary reason that we can only record the images. And basically, ideally. The width of your slit should be identical to your spatial sampling, right? Which is now wave independent because we have learned before that our spatial resolution depends on the wavelength. For the blue wavelengths, it's, it's better. For the red wavelengths, it's worse. And then we choose our spatial sampling as the uh, two times that, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And then, in principle, what we could do, we could now start moving this slit over the image and start assembling the data cube again. Except now different moments in time will not correspond to different wavelengths in the way they, they corresponded for fabric girl They're going to correspond to different X or Y. Okay, they're going to correspond to, to different slices. So if we were going to do that with, uh, with an example data cube that we played before, here is just a continuum image. And we're going to understand now why this continuum image is technically speaking not an image, or it's image of different time steps during the solar evolution. So this image is actually result of assembling many different slit positions. So at some point, people look at the sun and it looked more or less like this, but then they couldn't take the spectra of each of these pixels simultaneously, but instead you put the slit there. And this is actually exaggerated slit. Here I have only cut, here I can actually cut 10 pixels. While strictly speaking, you're only looking at one pixel at the time. 
So then you take this stripe here and you disperse it in Wayland and you would get something like this. And this is what your detector would measure, right? Then you measure this, save it, read it out of the CCD, move your slit, do another one. Do another one, do another one, do another one, do another one, and that way you assemble the view. Right. So we talked about before that here, Valent, I, I left on purpose all the pixels because it basically, pixels are what you measure in your camera. It might be conspicuous here that uh, Valent dimension is only roughly 100, while spatial dimension is 1000. This is because this is only one modulation position, right? So the cameras on, on you know they have the multiple. I think there so. Two? How many? There, there, there should be at least two. Right. Still, it's two hundred. Should be two hundred. Yeah. I will check exactly what is going right, on for the, because we don't need it for the for the next lecture. I will check exactly the dimensions of cameras. Can you do maybe know how many? So it's a thousand, but a few hundred, or yeah. what? Yeah. So it's so whatever it's time. Or maybe it's just camera where they don't read the, right. all the right. all the pixels. Yeah. It's back yeah. Back okay. And then finally, if you were to read uh, one of these individual uh, Y positions here, you would get a you would get a spectrum. So this way we get a thousand spectrum, and we move our slit. We get another thousand spectra. Then we move our slit again. We get another thousand spectra. And for this specific map, we had two thousand different slit positions, so we get two thousand times one thousand spectra. And this actually is the basis for most of the other. Technically, it's also the, the basis for the double pass spectrograph, except that one is very complicated for me, so I didn't circle it on purpose. But most of the methods here, if I'm not mistaken are based on the principle of spectrogram, right? So this is the, the classical way, this is what we have seen now, is basically that you are slicing your, your 3D cube one wide position at the time, right? But then you can have a setup which have multiple spectrum, multiple spectral slits, so that way you can do it faster. And then you have various integral field solutions that sort of slice your image and then send these slices to one big slit and that, that slit does the dispersion and then you recombine it, recombine it again, right? But we won't be talking about these ones, we'll mostly be focusing on at the, just the standard spectrum of rasters as they, as they call them. So when you see somewhere that it's a raster scan, it's basically this, this method of just putting the slit and then moving it in, in discrete steps to, to sample the surface. Right, so now if, you, if we were going to look at, at what happens with the uh, uh, smile now a bit, I was really proud of making this slide. <laughs> so now what actually happens is the telescope is, is something like that. So you have the image that is forming the focal plane, which contains all the wavelength information, right? And from that image, your slate cuts out only one small piece. And that piece, then that piece is sort of collimated, is made parallel, reflected of the grating. So the wavelengths are separated and then focused again. So basically what you get finally on your detector, and usually we will only focus on one order. Not necessarily, but you, I don't think that you look at multiple, multiple orders at the, at the same wavelength. And then you measure something like this here. And actually like in most solar telescopes where I was, usually you can, you can see these being acquired at CCDs in real time. So you see your spectral lines, over your slate, how they how they look like. So if there is something really exciting happening, like the lines are moving left and right, or going from absorption to emission, you can more or less see that see that happening. Okay, cool. So let's talk a little bit about this specific data cube that we have seen, and we will see some of the disadvantages of the spectrograph straight away. I mean, the the most obvious one is that we said that we have like two thousand slit positions. So how much time do you think it took to acquire the whole data cube? We have to have 2,000 different slit positions. And for each of them we have to, huh? Minutes. 
May more than have tens of minutes at least. More, if you, you are tens of minutes at least. But technically, for this map, it was roughly three hours, which is a lot of prolonged exposure. Well, no, it was three hours for e for for all of these all of these yeah. Yeah. You know, three hours divided by two thousand is is pretty good. It's a pretty long yeah. exposure. Well, it's a few other one actually. Point so. one seconds. It's uh, it's less. It's so like uh, five, five seconds. Five seconds only. I think ten thousand seconds. Yeah, okay. Yeah. 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 Yep. Yeah, I think they're fast. Okay, yeah. uh, that was the fast. Four seconds. Was and the deep is 15 moment. seconds or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So. so each of these was roughly, so each of the slip positions was four seconds, right? But I mean, even with four seconds, which sounds pretty short, right? When you when you look at the image, and here I can only cut the one part of the image, when you look at the image, the left, since since these are different, different slip positions, the left part of the image is left, assuming that we go from left to right, the left part of the image is three hours younger than the than the right one. So these granules here come from are already dead at the moment when we made the images of these these granules here. And that's also related to something that Kevin told you a few days ago is that this this three hours compare very poorly even to photospheric time scales, right? We usually say that important number in photosphere is time scale of granules, which is 20 minutes, maybe, or even less. Probably we now see changes with the better spatial resolution, we see changes on even smaller scales. So, so yeah, this is not sun in one moment. However, it doesn't really matter, right? Because if your scientific goal is to look at the granules during the quiet sun phase, it doesn't really matter that the granules on the very you know, on one side of the image are different than the granules on the left side of the image because you presume they're not really connected to each other. So these are just some quiet sun granules here, quiet sun granules there. So it doesn't matter a lot. But for me, it's really mind-boggling that, that the image looks, when you look at this image, uh, on, the, on this screen the contrast is, is very weird, but maybe on your, on your computers it looks better. When you look at the image, it looks very reasonable, right? But it's actually, acquired at different times, which is very weird. And somehow each two slates are very close in time to each other, but then as you go, things are changing and so on and so on. Right, okay. Cool, so we went through this. So this compares pretty poorly. So now we can sort of stress some of the advantages or maybe disadvantages. <clears throat> so first thing is, at least for me, when I was thinking about this a little bit further, is that slicing the cube this way is somehow less intuitive, right? Like if you were to look at the sun at one wavelength, if you were to make one fabri parallel exposure, you would at least get an image at, at one wavelength and you would say, okay, this is what I'm seeing. If you were to expose one spectra, you would get somehow a weird sample, right? You would get one slice of the solar surface in all the wavelengths, which however, when you think a little bit about it, it can also be useful. And let's say that I wanted just to look at, well, we, we talked about it before, let's just say that I wanted to look at the properties of granules, and now by putting my slit here, I'm cutting over a reasonable amount of these granules. And for example, I could just sit here, keep my slit at this position, measure photons, get very nice, very accurate spectra by having a very long exposure. And that way I could maybe infer something statistical about these granules, even though that I have no further context what's happening at different, at different text positions here and there. Does it make sense? And actually, there are some observations like that, especially before with, the, with for example, looking at the, at the phenomena that, uh, that requires huge amount of photons, like, for example, scattering polarization. All our measurements of scattering polarization are basically averaged over space. So you just put your slit somewhere, you record the spectra and the polarization, and you average over more or less the whole slit. And that way you have spectra, which is very, very precise, is average in space, so there is almost no spatial resolution. I mean, you know that you are roughly at the limb or at the center or blah, blah, blah. 
and so on. But that way you learn something about the phenomena on average. So you are, you don't have the, the spatial spatial resolution, right? Okay, let's go to that. So another consequence is that sampling in wavelengths is sort of given by our diffraction rating and our dispersion and is basically uniform. I can't skip the wavelengths that I don't like, right? If we had a fabric row and we wanted to look at some spectral region where we have two narrow lines and a lot of continuum, we could just say, okay, I'm looking in deep, I'm looking five positions in this line, nine positions in this line, one position in the in the continuum, and that's it. Here, there is no that, right? You look, you get the whole spectrum from this region to this region. That's it. And it's pretty much uniformly dispersed. So if you want to look at two lines that are separated by the continuum, you're going to get that continuum in between, and that's it. And generally speaking, this raster scanning, if you want to cover a huge region, is always going to be much, much, much slower than if you're using a fabric barrel filter. Does it make sense? So, of course, this doesn't mean that one method is inherently better than the other one, but it depends on, on what you want to look at. Right? So when you think about your scientific problem and you're like, okay, I want to look at such and such events, you need to think and say, okay, how big spatial coverage I, I have, how much time uh, do I need to, to, to cover, how fast my object is changing, what signal to noise do I need, and so Okay. However, there are there are some, I mean, in the same way that, that we are disadvantaged in terms of time, we are, for example, I would say maybe a bit advantaged in terms of spectral resolution, the context that it sort of behaves a little bit better, like it really drops to zero, and when you really have a, a lot of a lot of grooves, then you then you really have nice and well defined uh, transmission. But it is somehow offset by overall work efficiency, right? So still, you're always going to lose some light to other maxima and so on and so on. You're always isolating a small, a small piece. And strictly speaking, with the, uh, with the spectrographs, we do obtain some sort of an image, right? But that image, which is uh, Y and lambda, is not the image of the sun. So we can't really employ image restoration techniques. With fabric we somehow implicitly uh, assume that the light, that the image that goes through fabric is basically the same thing as, as the image that we talked about before. It's just we have one wavelength isolated, so we could employ all the image re restoration techniques and they would look fantastic. Here we could not do that, at least not with, uh, with huge amount of, uh, uh, with huge amount of pepper. For example, one thing, that uh, I just want to show here very briefly is this technique which was originally proposed by Christoph Keller but finally executed by Michiel van Nord is basically the idea that simultaneously to performing your raster scan you also record the images of the of the of the same region in in some other channel I mean the best is to use this so-called slit jaw image which is everything except the slit and then from this image gives you context which allows you to, to obtain your, uh, your basically PSF of your atmosphere and everything else. And then you can infer the PSF from the, from the context images and apply them to your spectra to sort of deconvolve them. And of course there is a lot of numerical and other problems to doing that and this process is very, very numerically demanding. But as you can see here, we have a very small surface of the sun so here, over Y, it's maybe five or six megameters, so okay, maybe a little bit more. But you can see maybe that even at this relatively poor uh, color, color uh, scheme that I have chosen here, and this is just one meter telescope, the, the shape of the granules is very nice, and we obtain quite a nice resolution even from a ground-based telescope. Of course, since you're exhibiting this, since you are you know, using an image restoration technique, you are amplifying the noise. We were talking about this also before, so this also suffers from the same disadvantages that the other image restoration techniques are, are going to suffer. So in principle it is possible, but we can leave that for, for the future because I don't think this would be so easy to do with first generation thickest instruments.
So now a little bit about like practical things, and, and I wanted to talk a bit uh, what happens when, uh, how the spectral resolution in general, not only not only in the case of spectral photographs, but also in the case of fabric barrels, uh, is gonna influence your other spectra. Yes. Before you go into this, um, maybe I missed it, but one of the big advantages of spectrograph is that you have all of the spectrum at once. Yes. That, that is important when you have very fast phenomena. That you, yes. Or if you were looking at a flare, yes, yes, so sampling your line yeah. in yeah, yeah, five yeah, yeah. seconds might be a problem. Completely correct. Yeah, we didn't really, we didn't really, uh, I didn't really emphasize that so much. But, but yes. So once again, the the spectrum of all this slate or this small slice of the image is obtained in one moment. So although I don't have any X information whatsoever, I don't have any spatial information on log X. I have this spectra recorded in, in one moment. So if there is something interesting changing along Y, in, I, I will see this in one moment of time, right? So as Jana said, if you look at something that happens very fast, and we don't need to know fully spatial variation of, of the spectrum, but we are happy with just, you know, having spectra at, for example, quiet sun and the flare at the same time, maybe spectrum Maybe like the long long phase spectroscopy is good enough because we obtain all the spectra at the same time. Okay. So you're showing this for absorption lines. Yeah. Uh, so here, so why can't I use? Why can't I make a big wide slit and get a whole image out? Why does my slit have to be? Why does your slit have to be narrow? Right. Well, because then you would mix your wavelength and your spatial information, right? Mm -hmm. So in a way, when we, uh, so, so that's what I said before, but maybe it's a good idea now to emphasize it a, a little bit, uh, a little bit further. When we, when we look at the images, so, so let's forget about the spectra now, each, we assume, so we, we say, okay, the pixel is the smallest that, that we can resolve, and we, what we ultimately want to measure, as we said before, is the intensity coming from this one pixel, and for us this intensity is homogeneous, right? And strictly speaking, if we now have this image which covers, I don't know, 2,000 and 2,000 pixels, this, this slit should take exactly one pixel. Because if I make it wider and bigger, then I'm going to, in a way, well, not really average, but somehow I'm going to lose that spatial information there. I'm going to mix the information from these five pixels or ten pixels or whatever, whatever we do, right? So, strictly speaking, if our pixel for 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 our instrument should be spatially 0.01 arc second, then it means that our slit should also be 0.01 arc second in, in here, because we are sort of assuming, okay, it, it only comes from this one pixel, and this intensity is already the same in the one pixel, so I'm now just going to disperse it. In wavelength, and my my new x coordinate on the on the uh, on the CCD is going to be well, Was that okay, answer? Yes. Uh, so my question was: Is there a situation when I can have a big wide slit? Sure. When the when the nature gives you the slit. Well, <laughs> <laughs> when when I can still recover the spectral information, but by opening a slit, I get. Spatial information. But by opening the slit, you right. get the spatial information. Right. Right. So you're mixing the spectra from, from different, different points. Of points. The stuff. Yeah. And that's the problem here because the different points that my continuum are similar, is, right? my continuum is now mixed in with my line. Right? Yeah. I'm yeah. mixing that. Yeah. 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 What if I don't have a continuum? Oh. Mm -hmm. you have a I, I, but that's what I meant. It's like when you have flash spectrum, for example. Right, or any coronal spectrum, yeah. and you often see these things where they don't have a true slit because there's only a mission at certain distinct wavelengths. So yes. Can, you can get away without yeah, that's true. With a, a, a wider slit. Yeah, yeah because strictly speaking, it's not really gonna, like if I open slit more, it's not really gonna, uh, it's not really gonna average these five things, but the maxima are going to be at slightly different places, right? So if I really have no continuum, and I have a slit which is five pixels wide, I'm going to have five maxima visible in my in my spectrum instead of only one. That will carry a spatial 
Yes, that will carry. Yeah, that will sort of carry spatial information exactly. So then, couldn't the emission lights then interact? So pretty, yeah. they could be pretty dense. Right, depending. You have to yes, choose yeah. yeah. some. Yeah. And in, so, in fact, they used this technique early on, especially with the Skylab and so on, where they didn't have a slit; they just dispersed the image of the sun, and you could see all the different emission lines. And it was called the overlapogram. Overlapograph. <laughs> you saw all these uh, different spectral lines appearing at different wavelengths, sort of overlap, but you could sort of yeah. pick out. Yeah, actually, I forgot to. I forgot to. We can. We can. <laughs> yeah, we can actually look at it uh, straight away. I really wanted to Sorry. see. No, 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 no. It's great. I, I, I just forgot to put the image. Let's look at the. Right. Overlap program. Overlap program. Yeah, I mean you can have the 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 spectra that are uh, that are completely made without the slit, right? Right. Okay. So, but but this is what I meant when I said the nature gives you the slit yeah. because it sort of just isolates isolates the the very narrow range. And here actually you yeah. see the what are these coronal or or also chromospheric lines, both. right? Both mixed. Right. Yeah. Rachel, this was taken with the white slit? Yeah. No slit. No, no slit. slit. No slit. Yeah. Right. Wow. So then, yes. Yeah, so yeah you have... don't have any addition on the disc, right? But <laughs> you do have addition in the ring around the disc, which is the... Which is the natural part of the, part of the continuum, or something. but emission lines, and you see them as brighter. So in the red, so between green and red, that will be the, the D lines, or the hidden hole. Well, we don't have yellow, so it must right. be in between green yeah, and red. Yeah, yeah. And the far red is the H alpha, and then as you go into blue, there is the H beta. You know, you have that arc of the thing, but it doesn't overlap with any other emission line nearby, so it's, it remains distinct. Oh, wow. Yeah, of course, I mean, here we have like what? Uh, 400 nanometers spread over a few thousand pixels, maybe. So it's not the best spatial res spectral re resolution, but you see the you see the principle in a way, and and, and yeah, I think that for the especially for the nighttime, it's they used to have like slitless spectrographs in 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 many situations, right? Okay, but let's go back to our slides to so take a look at at a few more things. So this is also going to be a little bit describing my, my morning and, and what I was doing. So the principle I wanted to show you what are the effects of, of various spectral resolutions. And you are somehow already guessing that in the same way that our observed image was the convolution of the original image and the PSF of your primary or and the atmosphere, of course, uh, in the same way the observed spectrum in one point or average doesn't matter, it's going to be the convolution of the original spectrum and your, uh, let's call it spectral PSF of your instrument. If it's a fabric parallel, it's going to depend on this transmission curve of the fabric parallel multiplied by the transmission curves of all your pre filters and additional add ons and so on. In the case of the spectrogram, it's going to depend on the, on this uh, transmit, on this basically interference image made by your grating and so on and so on. So what I wanted to do is I wanted to take this beautiful Kinoda scan and average it and compare it to an atlas. Uh, and uh, here is that uh, here is that plot. So that doesn't take much to, to make. You can make it yourself. I gave you a link to one of the atlas that is available online. But then I was a little bit disappointed because the blue line, which is Kinoda, and you can already guess it even without the notation because these very narrow lines are missing in the blue spectra, and they are missing because they are created in the Earth's atmosphere. So you know they cannot see them, obviously, unless it looks down. <laughs> uh, and uh, but I was a little bit disappointed that these blue lines were basically not visibly broadened with respect to the orange ones. They are a little bit shifted here, and you see that they are a little bit more shallow. And uh, Actually, probably by playing with the parameters, you could figure out that maybe they are just a little bit broader, but so so that broadening is, is you know compensated by this thing. And then there is also in spectrograph there is usually an additional effect, something that we call scattered light, 
which is basically a continuous offset to your spectra. So generally, when you observe with a non-ideal spectrograph, your spectral lines are going to be a little bit more shallow than they would be in the, in the real life, and you have to find a, a way to, to correct that. And the appropriate way to do that correction is usually to average your spectra over some quiet sign and compare it with some, some atlas. I mean, some of you maybe already did this, did this kind of thing. So then what I did is I said, well, okay, uh, it's not super obvious, so maybe that's because you know the resolution is actually quite good. So you know the pixels are a bit bigger than they need to be. So for, spatial, for spectral resolution, we have the same principle that we have for spatial one. It's you usually, if your resolution is, for example, let's say 30 milli angstroms, you want pixels to be 15 milli angstroms big, according to Nyquist's theory, right? So you know the pixels in wavelength are something like 21 milli angstrom. But when you check what their uh, spectral resolution is, they say 30 milli angstroms, which corresponds to basically 200,000. Right, and I don't remember who, but somehow for this specific atlas, I had in mind the resolution of roughly 400,000. So I said, okay, maybe it's not so obvious, maybe I can, I can find a better one. And there's this form of famous broad and neck atlas from 1987. So I plotted that one, but then I saw another thing is that the lines are more shallow. So can somebody tell me now, how can in two solar atlases, lines can be so much different? Oh no, I gave you the answer. <laughs> yeah, I really need to learn these, but okay, why, why does it matter? Okay, so one atlas corresponds to this center, the other one is spatially average. Why does it matter? Come on. Even if you know, just say it. It's not the problem. <laughs> The limb, the limb or shower, usually the point, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So there are two effects. The one is the one is the rotation, which Kevin is suggesting here, right? So looking at the whole sun, if you really look at the whole sun, you're gonna see one one side of the sun moving toward you, one moving away because of the rotations. Your so your lines are gonna be a bit broader and corresponding a little bit more shallow. But there is also another effect, which is what Merajek exactly said now, is that the depth of the lines is not constant, is not the same at the center and at the, at the limb, right? So we can do that and we'll actually try to model this uh, uh, during, the sec during the next part of the course. We'll try to see how, the, how basically the depth of the lines probes the temperature structure of the atmosphere and that since the temperature structure is not completely linear, but it changes, strictly speaking, the depths of your lines change. So the anyway, your 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 atlas, which is made only for this centrum, and, and when we say atlas, we mean the spectrum of some kind of average sun. So there is no spatial information whatsoever. There is no granules in the grand. Although some people made atlases of like plages or sunspots and so on, especially when it comes to depolarization and so on. Okay, so then I, I said, well, okay, why would I do that? When, when Kevin is in the house, I can go and, uh, I can go and, uh, and ask him. Just physics world is sending the locations. So Kevin, then Kevin shared with me these amazing slides, which actually illustrate how we can uh, Actually, this, this is not splitting, this is literally substituting the known values, but it's also a very good uh, uh, thing. So, this is, uh, this is the observed spectra, right? That's the disk center. Yeah. Ah, this is the atoms. Okay, so the, so the title is, okay. So, this is, ah, yeah, this is, so what we're going to look at, look at here is we're going to look at comparison between the reference atlas, which in this case has some insane spectral resolution, with what we observe with our instrument, right? So this is the reference. This is something that we should obtain. Then we take that and we convolve it with our known uh, spectral PSF of our instrument. And you can see now this effect that I told you before. The lines are very little broader, and you can maybe the best see it in this case of this shallow line here, which I think is oxygen. Right, something, something like that. And you actually can see that it's a little bit broader and, and more shallow. And for iron lines, so these are, I didn't stress that enough, but I maybe you already know, 
these two lines that we are looking at are two famous 6301 and 6302 lines. And if you want to use DKs, you'll probably see them mentioned a lot of times. And they are very convenient to study for studying the photosphere because they are magnetically sensitive, sensitive to photospheric magnetic fields, photospheric velocities, so you can infer all these things from that. Right, so we see that lines are, are a little bit more shallow, right? And now what we can do is we can now actually take our observations of these lines, which are spatially averaged, and compare it with this. Come on. And you see that they sit on top of each other very, very well, right? So the blue line now is the, the spectrum observed with, with IBIS, right? The, the orange is what we think we should get when we convolve the true spectra, which is in this case Atlas, with our known instrumental profile, and the green is the true spectra. So it doesn't agree perfectly, but it agrees quite well. Yeah. So why is it that the IBIS spectrum seems to follow the convolved Atlas for some of the lines, and it seems to follow the original Atlas for other lines? So like those, those two narrow lines, yeah. it looks like it what are the two narrow lines? Where do they, how do you get a line set here? Not, not from the sun. <laughs> right? So those two lines are uh, atmospheric, as he mentioned before. And so their actual strength depends a lot on what you have in your, in your yeah. uh, atmosphere that day. Then those are water lines? Uh, those are or oxygen, oxygen too. Oxygen too. Okay. So, so these are the very difference between observing and peak and sand. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the time of day. And the time of the day. So actually, what you're going to have for your homework and what you will actually do when you get your observations, because you you do get some prescribed spectral resolution, but you're never really sure how how close to reality we are, is that you want to reverse engineer this. You want to take the atlas observations. You want to take your own observations and convolve them with various numbers to get the good agreement to say, okay, now I know roughly what my spectral resolution is. And that can be very important if you really want to accurately and quantitatively, you know, analyze your, your observations because this, for example, can be very important in case of very narrow lines or very, sh or very deep lines where, you know, it's, it's important for us to know exact numbers. How deep is the line, how broad? Et cetera, et cetera. Okay, and strictly speaking, that way, I mean, not strictly speaking, but also that way you will infer how much of the scatter light you have in your, in your instrument, and you can also do one more thing, is that in principle, you could calibrate your, your observed spectra to real physical units. If you have a reference spectra in real physical units, then you can even fit that part to, to obtain uh, to convert this in your real physical units, which might be, for example, important if you want to, to relate your intensities to some sort of radiation temperatures or something like that. Okay. Which is also something that we will have in our independent work. And then Kevin also shared with me this interesting video here, which shows a thing for a little bit, uh, maybe less uh, spectrally pure instrument. Uh, so what we have here on the top left is a simulated surface of the sun uh, with a few wavelengths. Oh, this is not looping. Okay, let's make this video. Now. Uh, and then here, the blue line is the average spectrum that you see. Red is how that average spectrum would be polluted or degraded by your spectral PSF, your instrument, which is in this case a filter graph, right? And uh, then on the top right, you see the image of the sun at successive wavelengths, but now convolved, right? So you can see already on the way that the image is, from the look of the image is that the contrast is a bit different. And the reason for that is that now your spectral information is sort of mixing. Now this core of the line has some contributions from the nearby continuum, right? So you can look at the images up here and you will see that, the, for example, this moment where, where the left image is the darkest, the right image is not nearly as dark. Because at the moment where I should be seeing, I don't know, inverse granulation or something like that, in an ideal case, 
in the case where my spectral resolution is relatively bad, I still see a lot of parasitic or unwanted continuum radiation mixing up and, and spoiling the image here. And actually you can see it maybe nicer in this uh, bottom right plot, which shows how the contrast changes <coughs> with, uh, with wavelength. And you see here that basically for the far continuum, obviously it doesn't matter, right? But if you have perfect spectral resolution, you should be able to see very high contrast at the line core, right? So because line core probes different regions of the atmosphere and, this, and the temperature contrast there, there is different. However, because our spectral resolution mixes that up a little bit, then we see much poorer contrast. Does it make sense? So in the same way, if, if, if we were looking at, we were intrigued, our, our ultimate goal was to obtain this x, y, lambda, q, right? And the BSF of the telescope and the atmosphere were mixing information in x and y, right? They were convol convolving our images with some BSF. In the same way, the spectral BSF of our instrument, be it spectrograph or fabric parallel, mixes the information in lambda direction. So basically what we see finally, when we look at the 3D Stokes cube, the Stokes intensity cube, is we see it convolved with some instrumental effects, which are PSA of the telescope, PSF of the atmosphere, speckled PSF of our analyzer, and so on and so on. Some of these things we can uh, eliminate, some of these things we cannot. So for example, generally, at least in the data that I worked with, we we don't try to deconvolve this, but instead we, we account for it in our interpretation schemes, right? We say, okay, when I'm comparing some model and uh, observations, I will convolve the model with the same spectral PSF as I, as I think the observations are convolved in order to, to learn something. But, uh, uh, for example, for the spatial ones, it's much harder to do because we very rarely interpret 3D Stokes cube as whole. We're gonna talk about it more later. So we try to eliminate as much of these effects as we can in order to be able to interpret the spectra of each pixel separate. Does it make sense? Yeah. Okay, very good. So, so basically we, we have now learned in a way how we can spectrally analyze the data, well, not analyze, but separate the data, how we can get the spectra. And there are actually ways, I mean, the natural question now is can we somehow circumvent this need to trade time for either lambda coordinate or x coordinate in this case. And there are ways to do it and we can uh, simply uh, use some of these integral field units in order to basically sacrifice field of view in order to have simultaneously all the wavelengths of one small image at the same time, right? And there are a few ways how to do it, and the instrument that we will be able to do it the biggest is called DL NERSP, and it's going to be based on, um, how do you call them? Fiber optics, right? And with it, basically, you will be able to obtain the spectra of some moderate amount of pixels in one and go, right? So you will say, okay, I'm looking at this small region of the solar surface, I get the spectrum of each pixel in I don't know, one second, five seconds, whatever your, you want your exposure time to be. Uh, I have put the link to this uh, easily accessible solar atlas online, so you can do this sort of comparison on your own, and there will be some need for you to do that because it will be the homework. So, yeah. This was everything for the day. Next week, we're going to talk about polarization. Do you have any questions? Is this more or less understandable? This is something that you have probably seen before, but I just wanted to go through it and show where the things come from. Okay, no questions? Cool. Then uh, see you Tuesday. We will start maybe a few minutes late because there is another brown bag that probably most of you here will in Boulder will attend. And I will also share actually our our Zoom with the people online, so you can also attend the brown bags if you if you want. These are weekly weekly seminars here at Denso. So okay, 
Thank you for thank you for attending and see you soon. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.